Okay, welcome. This is Dr. Paul. This is Bridges Live. We're about ready to go live on my cameras, but as you know, also on my podcast channels, you get to go live first. On You can catch it on any podcast channel you like or where you ever get all your podcast shows. I am Dr. Paul, and I am with Dr. Larry Ward, who is the founder of the Lotus Institute. Now, before we get there, most of the people on podcasts who is not able to see the live show visually... Dr. Larry Ward is a black guy, and I was telling him off air, we don't normally see black Buddhists. So I want you to talk to people about, not about being a black person, not about being a Buddhist, but how we can go about healing our nation and ourselves through this traumatic period we call suffering. Okay. Well, I'm going to share where I'm working on myself. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on myself and integrating uh, my practice models and skills uh, into transforming my nervous system. And I say that because the nervous system we have now as Americans, I'll get to the rest of the planet later, but as Americans is not capable of moving forward fast enough and dramatically enough to save our lives. The second thing is, uh, for me at the planetary level, I could say the same thing. So we have been conditioned by our experience of white supremacy, our experience mm-hmm. of colonialism um, in the last 500 years to put up with it, to be okay with it. Even when we resist, even when we revolt, we, we end up playing the same game. And so for me, uh, what's important, as I looked at my life and looked at history and society, I realized that uh, our, our conditioning is not just conditioning of our thinking. It is also con- systems. Our very brains are Mm -hmm. conditioned not to move forward into a future that is well for all of us. And and that seems, and, and when I end up talking with people about that, to let them know that it is their conditioning that gets them more confused than what they are doing. And they, so we, we try to get people to recognize the conditioning that they're in. Mm-hmm. But here's here's we know there's a trouble with different mental illnesses and people who are going through therapy. How does one recognize something if they've never seen the other? That's exactly the right question. So, I mean, in, in the modern world, we are not conditioned to recognize, even identify, or name wellness. We are preoccupied with what is not well, our images, our language structure, our economics, our commercials, you can go on and on and on, but everything is communicated to us, by us, through a filter of unwellness. Right. And and so we now come to expect, well, being unwell must be normal. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I, being sick is okay yeah, being sick I think that is tragic <laughs> not just sad, it is tragic because it shows up in our institutions yes, in our economics, in our politics and in our culture, in our very psyche mm-hmm. is uh, full of these troubled waters you know, when we talk, I mean, when we, you and I, but when Buddhists talk about suffering, we talk about the suffering of how not to just dismiss it, but to understand it and embrace it. You want to talk more about that and why that is taught in that format about embracing the suffering mm-hmm. to allow yourself to mature through it so you can get to that next stage of your existence. Okay. Well, that, I think... It's a wonderful way of describing it. So for me, the practice, uh, one way of practicing is to to recognize your suffering, call it by its true name, Mm -hmm. to accept it for what it is, 
to embrace it and release it into transformation. And, and that for me is an embodied practice, not just a thought practice. Correct. And please explain that that embodied type practice, and because there is a wholeness to it. Me and people, when every time I want to say wholeness, people need. I want people to think of a circle, a mm -hmm. complete without brokenness circle. So when we say the wholeness, we're talking about the complete circle of it. But go ahead. Yeah, we're talking about the complete circle of human experience, and, and which includes the body mm -hmm. and our. In Buddhist language, our feelings or our tones of our experience, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Uh, it includes our perceptions of reality, which is where we are, in my view, most unwell. And uh, it, it includes recognition and acceptance also of our, our habit energy of our own minds our mental formations, our fabrications, our stories out of touch with reality. Mm -hmm. And facing those things and understanding that this facing is facing humanness itself. Because it, it is humanness. It's part it of it. It's human. Too exactly. And there's no reason to run from ourselves. <laughs> That's that's so well put, you know, when we talk and I actually think in the and the, and so I know let me go back. I know okay. when people watch Bridges Live, they've seen Dr. Paul, they know who Dr. Paul is. And I want you to give a little bit of snippet of how you got to where you are living now and existing in this form now and where you got here. Because for me, all my kids would say, you're like a Chinese black man. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, we, you know, you, you practice this, you believe in Christ, and yet you're a practicing Buddhist. But most people still, they, their heads turn like they're an owl. Like they just, they can't believe it. So please explain this. <laughs> well, my, my journey, um, if I had to summarize it briefly, is, I have always been compelled toward religious life, mm -hmm. religious study, and religious practice. I'm a contemplative social activist and planetary in planetary consciousness. And my journey began in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm told I was born, and I was adopted uh, by a great family and church three times a week, early Sunday morning prayer meetings, on and on and on. But what I, when I look back, what I gain from that is an awareness of how, how important it is to have discipline in your spiritual practice if you hope to be well. The hope to be well. Yes. Not and just well, but the hope. Just, the hope <laughs> to be well and building the capacity to right. recognize wellness when it should shows up in my body and when it shows up in my mind. And and so over 25 years or so studying and teaching Christian theology and community development, etc., around the world, villages, inner cities in the U.S., um, I got introduced to Buddhism really in India. And after that, everywhere I went in the world, I would visit a temple in order to practice because it made me feel better. Mm -hmm. It helped me recuperate from the energy I was putting out trying to save the world. Mm -hmm. So I had enough energy to go back at it again. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I am always going into the temple, or finding a temple, um, outdoor temples. Many people don't know that there's a lot of outdoor temples that are just free for you to go in and or just uh, do the practice. Do the training, right? So now that you that's how your journey is, and even teaching ministering in the Christian religion or, or, or understanding, how do people, how do you explain to people the difference between the two and how you can do both? Well, again, my point of view is uh, pragmatic. Uh, I know a lot, I, I understand a little bit of, uh, well, no, I understand a lot of different benefits of spiritual practice from many traditions of peoples around the planet. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I was in Africa, 
I spent time studying and learning from African traditions and their contemplative practices and their healing practices. And when I was in Hong Kong, I learned Tai Chi and spent time in the monasteries every Sunday and, or the weekend. And so, and you know, I've been to Korea up in the mountains and monasteries and well, I, in Japan, uh, I usually teach before COVID twice a year in Japan, taught in Thailand lived in Thailand and so I have benefited around the world from the various ways and learning. Buddhism has expressed itself mm -hmm. culturally but because I have a core practice I find I can go anywhere and know how to practice and feel comfortable in my own skin and is that is and for 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 many others, I think because of this pandemic, because people were able to get a closer view on their anxiety, their closer mm -hmm. view of their personal frustration, it was hard to deny whatever that was blocking them from mm -hmm. truly living. Mm -hmm. Now that they have that acknowledgement and some are still going to deny it, push it away, yeah. and yeah. try to say, well, when this is over, when this is over. And, and I've said this, when you start using the words, when this is over, you're not accepting what it was with you at that moment. Exactly. How, now that people are going to recognize that, what do you think their next step can be to, to allow them to have the hope? Well, uh, to me, the, the next step is to... Don't be in a misinformation. Okay. Uh, the latest scientific study on COVID by several experts, quote unquote, who I, I, I know they are expert in their fields, uh, that it's likely this is an endemic now, Ooh. not a pandemic. Meaning it will be with us always. Yes. Like the flu, like measles, like et cetera. And... And so we still have this image of going back something, you know, that's kind of the shadow of the American catastrophe, especially in terms of race. This, this myth, uh, this longing to go back somewhere that never existed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 and therefore, really hard to be in the present with the suffering present now connected to the past and to the future. So I think uh, the steps going ahead is, one, learning how to contemplate the experience of safety in your own body and learning to do visualizations and meditations that give you a physical sense of your own solitary safety. The second thing is to, to look around your environment and see how your environment is contributing to your well-being of sense of safety. Yeah, but see, not. but here's the thing. Like, I grew up in New York. I'm in Maryland now. Um, Baltimore has such a huge crime rate. There is yeah. all this nastiness that reminds people, okay, it influences people's minds to keep them where they think they are. Exactly. Now, and the reason why I say that, because there has been different ways that people said, whether they've been in prison, whether right. they've been, um, wherever they've been held yeah. without being released, they had to free this first. Exactly. And, you know, the, the trauma of mm -hmm. all this, uh, that's the, the third thing I would say that's important to get through where we are is to educate yourself on how the body holds trauma mm -hmm. and how it transmits it from generation to generation unless it's healed and how it exists collectively in the psyche of the whole society. It is not simply an individual matter. And this is one of the great misperceptions that covers um, our suffering as a society around race. We portray everything as if an, a unique, unhinged individual misbehaved instead of real that person lives in a context that gave him the conditioning to do so. So people can ask questions on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I, there's a question that came up here, Dr. Larry, who said, okay. we know that fear holds us. 
But how do we know that we're not holding on to fear because it feeds us? I think that that's is a, a wonderful. I I great brilliant. question. Brilliant, right? It's brilliant. <laughs> whoever, whoever that was, you're already a Zen master. <laughs> No, I, I'm serious. It's true. It's true. It's so, that's so, it. That's it. So, I so in, agree. In, yeah. in uh, some traditions of Buddhist, different Buddhist schools, what you feed your mind right. is what you become. And Madison Avenue knows this, at least neurologically. Commercials, a woman in... A uh, bathing suit selling yeah. toothpaste. Yeah. You think that's by accident? Yeah, no. I mean, no. so we, you know, we know what activates ourselves at at some levels mm-hmm. of awareness, but we ignore. You, you hold on, Doctor Larry. You ourselves. you broke up just a little bit. We ignore what you you you, you got stopped there. <laughs> We ignore the the levels of work in our own internal life Mm -hmm. that allows us to be free. It's not that fear doesn't come up. The practice of Buddhism has helped me understand I am larger than fear. I am the blue sky. Fear is a cloud. Mm. It's a real cloud, Mm -hmm. but it's only a cloud. It's only a cloud. (laughs) Yeah. And in that cloud... I love that context, understanding that I love nature, and I think I've always loved nature. Nature teaches me every time I'm in it. It is about, you know, that oneness, understanding the universe. And I don't want to get too far out there for a lot of people, but nature teaches us not just about what it's doing, but where we're at in our visualization of how we can see it to what it's doing. When we see a butterfly, we we just... Some people might just look at the butterfly, but they don't look at the transformation it had to be. Mm -hmm. To be in that flight, the time you see it, it went through something, you know? Think about the life of the butterfly, the crystallization. Mm -hmm. It was a hard life for that butterfly to become the butterfly. And we, we look at only the butterfly in its beauty, but we don't marvel at it as its transformation. Exactly. And, you know, part of the conditioning around that is our, our um, passion for convenience. Mm. And so as a society, everything has become so convenient, so reachoutable, so give it to me now, that our nervous system, which is being trained by that, Correct. barely recognizes things that take a journey. We can see it in everything we do from our economics to our politics in that we are are caught in immediacy and the capacity to think long-term, create long-term, work together long-term is extremely weak. I think people are tired of hearing life's a journey. Mm. And And I understand why because I think they just it 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 hurts so much and if a journey is supposed to hurt so much which it isn't it again goes back to reiterate what you said it's about what you allow your mind to think you what you are in but for most their journey is in so much turmoil and trauma and i and i think that key word is key to Understand that until you work on on a practice to heal, you are living through trauma or trauma filtered life, and All that's the time. and that's tough for people to agree to if it has gotten them to safety. Yeah, and that the the challenge with that is that is safety exists on many levels. Mm-hmm. And so part of our conditioning uh, in in our colonialized construct, which we actually still in, in my view, mm-hmm. uh, is to uh, convince us we are safe when our body tells us we are not. Right. And um, 
you know, if we were, if we felt safe here, why does, you know, there are many, so many people have enough weapons to attack a country Mm -hmm. in the garage. I mean, come on. (laughs) And that's insanity. That is complete unwellness. And, um, I don't mean you shouldn't take care of yourself. I'm saying this is insane. This is not taking care of yourself. This is living in fear. This is worshiping fear. And standing at the altar of fear as if it was the final meaning of life. It, it's hard for people, I, it, you know, and I understand when people are listening, I want people to thank you for all listening to Bridges Live. I'm talking with Dr. Larry Ward, who's the founder of the, um, the Lotus Institute. But one of the things is, is that people say, I got here through hard work. And their hard work was in a response to something. I don't think a response is from, to something is considered to be work or hard, but more of a survival instinct. Mm-hmm. And even if it got you away from something not good, and now it brings you to something that you may seem as prosperous or success, mm-hmm. I don't think that was all healthy. And that's difficult to explain to people too. Well, the way, the way I'm starting to explain that is our... our our, our vagal nerve, which is the largest nerve in the body, um, it has three pathways of responding to crisis or stress or survival. And the first state we go to as human beings and other mammals is the dorsal state. We hide, we try to get out of the way, we lay in the bush, <laughs> right, right. we play dead. Yeah. We withdraw our energy, withdraw our presence, and withdraw our engagement in society. That's one response, and that's a normal response to stress and trauma, because it's all about surviving. The second level of, the second pathway is the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And in that system, the body and mind are caught between the alternatives of fight or flight. And in my conclusions, the modern world is fundamentally designed <clears throat> to keep us in those two states. The withdrawn state, the immobilized state, or the fight or flight state. The third pathway, which you know from your own experience, is the ventral Mm -hmm. vega pathway. And it's the pathway that opens our bodies to curiosity, Mm -hmm. to creativity, to peace. I mean, it is, it is, it opens up that energy within Mm -hmm. us and our, our conditioning in our lives and our society, et cetera, really feed those first two states. And so for me, part of what the practice has done is I know how to access, stimulate, and develop my ventral vagus state. And I know how to use that state to transform my immobilization into rest. And I know how to use that state to transform my mobilizing energy to transcend fight or flight to drive toward vision of transformation. Now, that's part of the training you learned in the, in the practice you do so it's not as simple as people think it is by reading a book i truly no, believe <laughs> i truly believe you have to be taught i agree and and i understand that self help youtube this or that yeah. it's helpful but it's i believe it's harmful because in a room with a teacher who can hear your breath sounds, and mm-hmm. that's the difference for me when I'm teaching, I have to hear where your breath is traveling mm-hmm. from and to. Mm-hmm. And people say, Dr. Paul, how do you hear that? I said, well, I, that's a different explanation, but there is a different tonation in mm-hmm. breath as it's traveling or as it's coming from. You, you, you're not going to get that from a book. I am, I, I, I'm not sorry, but you're just not. <laughs> no, and, and part of the benefit of uh, having a teacher, in my own experience, is that what is being transmitted to you mm-hmm. is not just words, but energy itself. 
and um, and and so even though Thich Nhat Hanh is in Vietnam mm-hmm. in '94, I'm still energetically connected to him and the lineage uh, he comes from all the way back to Lin Chi. Yeah. And beyond. So uh, that's the benefit of cultivating a practice and a discipline with a teacher. You have you learn that your your energy is not yours alone. Right, it's shared. Your imagination doesn't have to be yours alone. Your your obstacles don't have to be cared for by you alone. <laughs> our ancestors can step in. Our teachers can step in, etc., and help us continue to evolve and grow. And you know when I explain the epidemiology of this, you know, because I like to explain to teachers why the things that they're doing and why it works on a cellular level, why it mm-hmm. works. Because I think, and and this is why I always, this is why I started Bridges Live, is so when I have guests, it's about information understanding, then it's an action. I mm-hmm. want you to hear something, and then I want you to understand. If you don't understand. Say, oh, Dr. Paul, I didn't, I, I kind of didn't really get it because I want you to ask the question. Because if you think you can listen to this conversation and be like, oh, I totally get what they're talking about, you're kidding yourself. You, can, you may be able to relate to it, which is what you're hearing. And it's good that you're able to have some relate to it. But to develop a relationship, you have to then completely understand it. Correct. Relate is not the same as relationships. In in our our Lotus Institute, our our theme is, uh, and I want to say, an understanding of journey is not linear, but present moment deepening. Mm -hmm. And that can help a person understand. Every moment is a part of your journey. Mm -hmm. And so in in Lotus, we say that we we are going deep, we're going deeper, and we're going deeper still always trying to deepen the practice in our own bodies, in our own minds, so it can leak out of us in the world. During this year, we've lost, death has been a heightened sense of awareness, the death. We've, we've had death throughout our time. But this 2020, the last several years, death has been risen like a frothy foam. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ignore the death and how it happened, the creation of it, but what's a good way of letting people understand that this is also part of the transformation? Well, I I think there's more than one way of describing this, but but one is, actually I wrote a note to myself, um, (laughs) earlier this morning after my meditation outside and it was something like I don't have it in front of me but it was something like I am living my precious life Mm -hmm. on a precious earth dying my precious death so for me life and death are simultaneous occurrences Mm -hmm. (laughs) happening at every moment Mm -hmm. and from, from, from a Buddhist perspective we, we have to remember that our language of describing mm-hmm. life, our language of describing death, is our language. Mm-hmm. It is not a capturing no. of the experience. No. It's pointing to something, but what it is pointing to is deep and wide and vast. So, um, you know, and as I, as I age, one of my meditation devices is my older dog. So I watch him every day, get a little older, move a little slower. And then while I'm watching him, I'm asking myself, where do I see that in myself? Do you become the investigator, Dalai Lama yeah. says. And I haven't yet not found it in myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am getting old. And that's normal. That's what happens on this planet. That's what happens when we're this, the fortune to be in this form. But every form goes through the same journey. And um, I, I, I had another poem I started. I haven't finished it yet, but it, it's something like, I mean, after all, once you understand this is a circle, it takes a lot of pressure off. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> it's coming back again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just don't know how, where, or when. Dr. Larry, if, if people want to come talk to you more or contact the Institute, please give that information. I will put it in the things when I things go out again and make sure it gets underscored. But if you want to, please let people know how they can get a hold of you. Sure. You can reach me at www.thelotusinstitute.org, all lowercase. How, how has... Oh, when as you're teaching more, probably do via Zoom and things like that, or the virtual stuff. Are the older students getting what they need, or are the younger students missing a lot until they are able to come in contact again? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. We've had the good fortune of most of our gatherings have, on Zoom have been multi generational, okay, and 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 multicultural. Except we have special programs we design for different groups based on their self identification and their needs, but. Um, so we've been, you know, we just did a, our first ser- our first in the third series of um, two hours of meditation in, in Japan, where we usually teach live. But we've continued to working with the community there that mm-hmm. are connected to our teaching. And the same in Mexico. Um, so... It helps. What we've discovered helps the most on the Zoom piece of puzzle is to have things enough time, enough time ahead of the event, so that the organizers create a space of energetic safety or of ritual. I love it. I love it because we do need that safe protection. Otherwise, we. In, in short, people, when, when Dr. Larry Ward was talking about, if you're in a, and this is what comes down to having a teacher, if you're in a room and you don't have a healthy teacher, you could end up getting very sick mm-hmm. from opening up your channels to other things right. on the outside. You know, all, my students who've trained with me and have always trained with me, they know I always seal the room with protection first. I have enough strong enough energy to seal that room. So when you're there, you can expose yourself to right. then start your healing process. Exactly. Not many teachers are able to do that. And I think after the euphoric sets gets out of that and people on their way home, they start to feel very nauseous and very sick. And mm-hmm. that's because the room may not have been sealed. So Yes. That's very, very important. And, you know, our ancestors knew this from many, many dimensions mm. and directions of this planet. And so I, I, I'm great. I'm grateful that I've been learning and continue to learn how, how to, um, create sacred space. Thank you so much. I'm going to allow you to go. I'm going to ask you to come back in another time, but okay. thank you so much, Dr. Larry. Enjoy your blessed well, thank day. Thank you. You take good care of yourself, man. Yes, sir. Yes. You practice well. Thank you. I know you do. So as Dr. Larry, um, he, he clears out of here, I just want people to know that as we were talking and as we um, we were visiting, there is more to life than just what you're going to give yourself and allow yourself to be given to. And what does that really mean? You can sign off anytime you want, Dr. Larry, anytime you want. Okay, I'm going to go to my next... Uh... Occasion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Take good care. Yes, sir. So thank you for listening. So we 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 must understand that it takes being taught. It takes developing a training, and then it develops a practice. Those are the things we must do. They're they're not synonymous. When someone says I've been training or I've been practicing, they're not the same. To train means to learn, right? To train means to learn. And as you are training, you then put that into a practice. And that's where the healing comes in. I know my next guest is, um, she is on her way into the room. So, um, and here she is. Oh, Delegate Shanika Henson. Thank you so much. 
You, you're so spotty and right on time. Look at you. You're muted, by the way, dear. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Are you able to hear me? I am. You, you, I can hear you fine. You're beautiful. And um, I know you're busy. So first, I want you to introduce yourself to Bridges Live. And then we'll get right into it because there's a lot of stuff to talk about, especially since you're about ready to close up session at the house, correct? Correct. So introduce yourself and then we'll go right into there, please. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. First, thank you for having me, for lending me an opportunity to be on your platform. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to get to interact with your audience. I'm Shanika Henson. I get the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to represent District 30A in the House of Delegates. My district is all of the city of Annapolis, so I get to represent Annapolis <laughs> in Annapolis, and it's the surrounding parts of Anne Arundel County. I get the honor of being the first black woman to hold this position. Um, whenever I speak to young people, I always say I'm the first black woman to have this job, but I don't plan on being the last. So I always try to make sure that as the door has been open for me, that I leave it open for the next person. I came to this position succeeding the late Speaker Bush. Uh, Mike Bush was my delegate for most of my life, um, pretty much all of my life. And when Mike passed, we had somebody that would fill the delegate position. And so I stepped up at that time to be delegate for my district, for my home, my hometown and my home city. So it's been quite a journey, um, but each day has been an honor and a privilege to be in public service. So thanks so much. You, you know, so now that when we, we get into public service, I'm not going to ask you why you got into public service because I really don't care. And the reason why I don't care is because you're, all, you're, not, you're already in and you're serving. So no matter how you got there, you're here. And I, threw, I, I just want people to learn how to serve. And I beg them to serve. Serve others. Serve humanity. Serve life. And, and me teaching the things I teach of life and life sciences is so you can be healthy enough so you can give of yourself. It's tough for many people to give and serve when they're so traumatized and they are internally, emotionally, physically sick because it takes a toll on you. So I hope you're staying healthy, Delegate Henson. I hope your mind is staying healthy. Your heart is being kept safe because... We're in a significant battle probably since six years. It's very heightened sense of a political racial death squad. And you're fighting against that. Tell us what's going on in your world and how you're fighting that racial injustice. Paul, that's so good that you have a focus with your platform to make sure that the people are sound, to make sure that they're whole and that they're taking care of themselves. We face many, many battles and the most um, important tool, the most important instrument that you have in any battle is coming to the, the battlefield, being whole, being intact and in one piece and being healthy. So to know that you've placed an emphasis on physical health, on mental health, on spiritual health and well-being, it's, it's absolutely paramount. And it's particularly important, too, in the area of politics. We know that in politics, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. People say one thing when they mean something different. Um, people say one thing when they're messaging to a particular and specific audience. Sometimes the power of the spoken word is used in ways that are very artful, very skillful, and very deliberate. Um, sometimes it's to provoke. Sometimes it's to send a hidden signal. Sometimes it's to make it clear um, who they intend to be, you know, the beneficiary of certain things and who's intended to be left out. So when you represent a group that is a racial minority um, in the state of Maryland, when you represent a group that, quite frankly, we were never intended to, to enter these buildings from the front door and sit in these seats and cast a vote and, and occupy these spaces. So when that's the group that you are a part of and um, in the, in the legacy from whence you come, you definitely understand that there are times where you have to make sure you protect yourself, your, your heart, your mind, your body, and your spirit when you are um, conducting the business and the will of the people. You know, we, we know that um, political arenas, if not from just television in itself, is a nasty situation because you are and who you have been the first of and not the last of 
like the Jackie Robinsons of the world, you, how do you feel about your safety? So I will say that with the events that happened on January 6th, where the Capitol was stormed um, and there was, was the attempt at overthrowing the United States government, that it definitely brought it closer to home mm -hmm. uh, physically. It brought it closer to home in terms of us having um, all seen and witnessed what that looks like. Um, for some for some members of any government trying to envision something like that happening seemed just so far off from any reality. But I know for myself, I mean, we've seen, well, not, I won't say we've seen, but we definitely have um, experienced as a people tyranny. We've experienced as a people mm -hmm. without the protection of government. And so we have a model for what that looks like. And we have a model for the destruction that's left after that mm -hmm. and needed to pick up the pieces if you want to try and carve out a path and move forward. We have a model for understanding the kind of honesty that you need to have if you want to move forward in a meaningful and significant way. And so when you hear members who are not willing to be honest about what's happened, but are moving forward as though um, the motivations for what's happened isn't what we all know are, are truly motivating that behavior. It really makes you have pause because it lets you know that the type of honesty you need to really move forward is perhaps not there or at least not present in everyone. And that there's some people who might be willing to hang on to those feelings if it benefits them. So that definitely was disheartening to come into session and to hear some members that are referencing what happened on January 6th. Um, we have a number of laws this session that are taking on making sure there's better access to voting. We have laws to make sure that incarcerated persons who haven't lost the right to vote can have access to the ballot even though they are incarcerated. To make sure that we are getting our vote by mail systems um, solidified for future elections to come. We realize that having drop boxes and having better access to the ballot is something that our voters have said that they want to have for future elections. So why would we take those protections and those accessibility features away? We want to permanently enshrine those in law. But members of the minority party have stood up on the floor to say that um, when you do things like that, that's when people lose confidence in the election process. And when people lose confidence, um, perhaps people will lose their willingness to obey the law. And so it's those kind of veiled hints and references to what we've seen and almost a veiled threat, if, if you would connect that piece that way as well, that lets me know that the type of reconciliation that we need to really turn a corner on that, I'm not sure that we are, are on the same page. You know, when we when you, you said this earlier that, you know, when people have these words and words have very meaning and, they, and they're hidden in veiled threats, or the veiled promises of this is where they're going to be, this is who they are, they're not willing to budge from it. And as growing up, as black people, we always were taught, and I don't even, I don't even have to know your parents or anything, but we're taught to get involved, make a difference, and stop complaining, right? You know how I know that? Because you're sitting in the delicate seat. You didn't say, man, this will always be wrong, and it'll never be right. Okay, well, let's see. Let me get in there, let me sit in the seat, let me do this, do that, and then when you're in that room and you finally hear those words of what you've heard historically, what people told you about what the opposition has said in the 60s, the 50s, the 30s, and now you're sitting in a room in 2020 and you're like, oh my goodness, they're still saying the same thing I read in my well, I was told, I, I'm, I'm not dreaming, but I cannot believe they just said this and it came out of their mouth. How does that make you feel? You're absolutely right. And that's where what you said at the top of, of our conversation comes into play. Mm. It's making sure that you have a, a good grounding, a good foundation, and that you are taking care of yourself mentally, spiritually, physically. Because we understand that while the body passes away, mm -hmm. this energy, a lot of what we see, it really just reinvents, recreates, and remanifests itself over time. But it has always been there. 
And we know that it's the same thing because it's the same tactics. It's just a different struggle every generation that has their own battle to fight. But it is always the same thing. And that is trying to hold back the line from being fair. I was telling a story to a, um, to a colleague of mine, a delegate, and I was saying that as a young child, I remember one time I got into a fight in a, in a bad neighborhood in Annapolis. And it was in my grandmother's community. She lived across the street from a community. Her house straddled the, okay. the line between a community that was good community and a community that was rough. And um, it, two girls, uh, one that was older than me, one that was my age. And when my grandmother came down to break up the fight, she only pulled the one off of me that was older. But the one that was my age, she said, You got to deal with this. <laughs> and I was explaining to my colleague. You got to deal with this. Your grandmother? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, my grandmother. I said, what my grandmother understood is that I couldn't be afraid of a fair fight. That's right. And so many people are afraid of a fair fight. Mm -hmm. No one's asking for an advantage. Nobody is asking for an opportunity to get a head start or go ahead of you. A lot of these measures that we are putting in place and attempting to put in place simply say that you have to be willing to engage in a fair fight. And that energy and that spirit that we see is the same one that was there from the beginning that's been saying, I will only fight you if you can tie both your hands behind your back, if you are not able to defend yourself, if I can beat up on you and there's nothing that you can do, if I can be two against one, that's what we see on the floor today. And so it's so disheartening to see that something I learned when I was in elementary school that some people still haven't found the value of. You know, we don't have the Jim Crow laws anymore, but we have the Jim Crow law mentality. Mm. And if it's, and if people think, and if this is, goes along with people who have had trauma in their lives, whether it be from a severe incident to a low incident, if you're living with trauma and you have not healed yourself through a trauma situation, not saying, I got over that and I don't think about that. No, that's not healing. That's forgetting. Forgetting it creates explosion. But if you have not healed yourself through those times and, and say, I am better and I am moving forward, and through, not over. I think still the opposition has not healed from the Jim Crow thoughts. They are still traumatized because of what took place by it being eradicated. So they still keep the thoughts and not the laws. And if they have the thoughts, then they imply it to everything they do. And wow, they, that's, that's deep. We, we're unable to change their thoughts if they're still thinking that way. Even if we change the laws, they find a way, like you said, to circumvent it, to put a little bit of this on there, so they're still able to be like, whew, we allow them to get this, but we're going to make sure we apply this. And that's what you're fighting against when you're in the house and when you're in session. And how does that sound in that type of voice and those type of written words? It must just, it must shake you to your core at times. It does. I think that um, for us, it is much more of a, of a, of a lack of, a, I won't say a lack of awareness because I think a lot of times it's very intentional um, and it's very um, crafty. And the goal is to to create a disconnect between reality and what's taking place. Mm -hmm. And so when people deny the existence of wealth disparities, health disparities, um, when people deny the existence of racial wealth. But we have the numbers. We're we not. The numbers. We don't even make this up. We don't say, you know, there's wealth disparity. Oh, yeah, prove it. Hold on. Very true. Here it is. Here, here are the arrest records. Here it is. Here's the arrest of all these black boys for possession, and they're getting 10 years, and the uh, counterparts, young white boys with possession, they're getting off with misdemeanors. There it is. There it is. Black people are 13% of the population of our state, but black people are 70% of the prison population. Black women are four times as likely 
four times as likely to die in childbirth as their white counterparts. Black women are the largest majority of people who are evicted in landlord tenant eviction proceedings by far out of any other demographic in the state of Maryland. 95% of black businesses are non-employer businesses. That means that they don't have employees. There are people who are working for themselves and can't afford to hire employees. But a lot of the funding that we give out, this over 80 million million dollars that we've given out in grants through the state of Maryland that our governor gave out during COVID, they excluded non-employer businesses. So you've excluded right out of the, not even being competitive, black businesses, 95% of them. We understand what the demographics and the challenges are that face our community. We understand them very well. But when we make policy and when we make law, we engage in debates as though, you know, these things aren't real or as though the, the core causes of them are not compounded over time, or as though the core causes of them don't exist to someone else's advantage. The flip side of being disadvantaged is advantage, and that exists somewhere for someone, but we deny that. You have the black community. Thank you for listening to Bridges Live, everyone. And if people want to talk to Shanika Henson, you're going to have to email and go through her, her onslaught of, what do you need? <laughs> Because it, we, we, black people, black communities have to go through health care. They have to go through education sep- disparities. They have to go through economics. They have to go through post-traumatic slave disorder. And they have to go through what you call job advancements. And then now, on this end, we have to go through the courts, legal issues, police issues, executive branch issues. <laughs> I mean, and then and then we say, you got a chance if you just believe and, and, and serve. That's a tough fight. It's a tough fight, absolutely. Absolutely. What do you tell people to keep fighting? How do you tell them? I tell people that we do have gains. I tell people... Mm-hmm. That while it is slow, while progress <laughs> has been slow um, to come, that when it does come, it is worth the fight. And that's why we can't give up. Um, I do think that for Black people in Maryland and for Black people in the U.S., when we put our collective force together and we really galvanize and we come together, we get great things accomplished and I think that's why I invest my time yeah. in public service because yeah. I've seen those those momentum shifts. I've seen those things happen. This session, we've done incredible things with police accountability and transparency. We passed out of the House of Delegates one of the strongest use of force standards that exists in any state in the United States. Right now, for police officers to be able to use force, they each different police um, department across the state of Maryland, they have their own policy. And some police departments using a chokehold on somebody is in deadly force. And some police departments, you can use, you know, arm holds, choke holds. It's all types of different standards between the different police departments. We got over 100 cities in 23 counties of Baltimore City with different police departments with different standards. We said we're not going to do that anymore. Mm. We will statewide use of force and we will set the bar on that so high that there are things you can do and things you cannot do and you have to respect the autonomy and the right to life to everybody that you are interacting with as a police officer that only happened because this summer people came into the streets people came to the state house and they said that they want to change they demanded that they said we're going to hold our leaders accountable and if you come out of session with anything that doesn't look like true change yeah. we're remember yeah. that And so when we come together, we really can get things accomplished. And I just want people to hear that. And the key word is come together. Yes, out of all those things I mentioned, yes, they're part of your journey and your practice and things like that. But come together because I'm going to let people know you are not alone. And I think if once people, black people, all people and people themselves understand, believe and trust Trust and believe, as my mother would say to me, you better trust and believe. You come in this house, and then I'm not going to leave that alone because my, <laughs> you better trust and believe we are going to change things. And we have to understand this, but it takes service. And the service we need from you, 
not from you, Shanika or Delegate Henson, is the service from people is to show up and vote, contact your representatives, be a part of the community, not a problem of the community. Right? We need you to be uh-huh. and go get mental health. Go get mental help. Say, I'm not sure if I can handle this. You right, you can. Not in the state you're in right now. You are not going to handle this battle. But we need you well. We love you. We are your brothers and sisters of this earth, and we need you well so you can stand with us and stand for us to stand against the opposition. Anything you want to say before I let you go, before you have to take off? You probably got more to do tonight and you got a long evening. I hope. Incredible. Husband and wife, are they okay? They're the husband and the kids, everyone's, they got their, do they, you guys need like a chicken dinner or something? <laughs> <laughs> They'll always take chicken. <laughs> Everybody's good. I am blessed. I got to say good. that I really feel that, you know, God, he, my mother says that God, he qualifies the cold. It's not the other way around. Right. It's not, you got to be qualified for God, God to call you. But after he calls you to service, then he will qualify you. So I really am blessed with a husband who believes in the work that I do. And he has his own way that he you know, works in the community and does work all the same. I have a son who really is passionate and believes in the work I do as well. Parents who are invested, who have been community servants my whole life. So I really am well supported in what I'm doing. And, and I'm blessed. I really am. I do want to give kudos to your husband. I do. You know, not enough people say thank you to the people who help other people and give them that support because they may see you when you leave the door but you have a support staff and a family who has you behind the door and I think that's so important so thank you and kudos to your husband thank you so much and thank you Miss Henson for coming on Delegate Henson I hope to have you more on after the session's over so we can talk about what we can do more of thank you Paul I appreciate it thank you thank you and have a good night you so too. I want everyone to think that I want to everyone to Thank my guests for showing up and being here on Bridges Live. We will have more to come. I actually have a show coming on right after this because we got to talk about the sickle cell situation in America. I'll see you in a few. See you next time. And keep sharing, liking, and loving because together we can serve. Thank you.